Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is sort of this invisible cloud that follows us all around. It's um, in our pockets, it's in our laptops, it's in our homes, it's the digital exhaust that we all produce uh, in the modern world, working with um, computers and uh, anything uh, that produces uh, digital content sort of breathes this exhaust of information that follows you around. It has your identity information. And people are using that data to do a lot of different things. And what I'm going to talk about is how to uh, sort of capture your own digital exhaust and channel it through uh, civic activity to engage government. In Italy, right now, six scientists are on trial for failing to predict the future. And this is true. This is uh, a trial that is going on that the actual story is that these scientists uh, were, they're seismologists and they track uh, the, the patterns of seismic shifts in the earth. And uh, they use that for the basis of predicting whether or not there's going to be earthquakes and if there are earthquakes, how severe they're going to be. Um, in this particular case, these scientists, um, they notice an anomaly in their pattern, which could mean an earthquake, or it could mean absolutely nothing. It's sort of a binary thing. Um, in this case, they chose not to say anything. Um, and this earthquake occurred. It ended up being a 6.3 magnitude quake, and it killed 309 people. And unfortunately, uh, the state chose to pursue this as uh, manslaughter. So these six scientists are on trial for not having uh, used this data in someone's eyes properly on behalf of the public. That makes me think of this quote by a friend of mine, Alistair Crawl, who says, data doesn't invade people's lives. Lack of control over how it's used does. And this was just very poignant to me because it, it, it speaks to various ways that uh, data can be misused on our behalf and it can also be uh, misused by others uh, who might wish to do harm or may just be negligent and unaware. So I'm going to take a step back and tell you about how uh, one of these platforms uh, sort of works. For the past few years, I worked with an organization called Ushahidi. Ushahidi was born out of Kenya uh, in Africa. Uh, it's a platform, an open source platform, that does something very simple. It takes your messages, citizen messages, during times of crises, and it puts it on a map so that emergency responders and people who want to help you can find you and so on. Um, and so this simple tool was created by uh, four bloggers, hackers, technologists during the 2008 uh, election crisis in Kenya. Um, if you weren't following the news then, it was um, a pretty severe time for, for Nairobi. The city was torn apart between these uh, sort of political sides and uh, there was violence in the streets and so on. Uh, the communication networks weren't really reliable at the time because the mobs sort of followed the flow of information. So if they discovered that people who they were angry at were in one area, they would go there and then people would move and so on. They'd follow them around. Um, <clears throat> With Ushihidi, uh, these, uh, the founders were able to create a platform for people to share information in ways that um, at the time weren't accessible to the, the mobs. And so you could sort of move around, you could see what, what the trouble areas were, you could avoid them and uh, get to safety. Uh, so this platform started there, but since then it's hit viral growth. It's been used all over the world. So it's open source, which means it's free, Anyone can use it, anyone can change it, anyone can modify it. So it's been used in disasters all around the world. Uh, uh, most recently, uh, well, a few months ago during the, the quakes and, and tsunami in Japan. Uh, and also uh, here in Huntsville, someone was using it to track a, a swine flu outbreak. Um, so this, this thing has just sort of gone all over the globe and it's been used for all sorts of things. And the reason why I feel it's, it's really important to be aware of technologies like this is because they, they put control back into your hands. Uh, you can capture this sort of information about yourself or others and use it for positive activity. So I'll show you another example of, of how this data, these data platforms are being used productively. Uh, and I'm just going to sort of walk you through several and then show you how they're being applied in other ways. So this is uh, data.un.gov, which is a portal for accessing much of the, the data that the UN collects in its activities around the world. Previously, th this information wasn't available to anyone other than the UN and maybe the World Bank and these big 
amorphous organizations that we never get to talk to. But in the last few years, there's been a change in the way these organizations conduct themselves, and they um, are now sharing more. They, it's a benefit to be transparent and uh, share the information that's being collected about societies. That means if you want to run a small NGO and you want to do projects in a certain part of the world, you can come here and leverage the resources and the research that the UN has put into collecting data, which I think is pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> Now, the, the most obvious sort of, I guess the one that probably touches the most uh, people in this room is crowdsourcing technologies. Technologies that allow you to take, like if I asked everyone in this room to go to my website, um, that would be crowdsourcing. I'm crowdsourcing traffic. I'm not going to do that because that would be advertising. Um, the, <laughs> the way that these sites work, dig.com, Reddit, and Storyful, they essentially ask you, or I report on CNN, they essentially ask large amounts of people to do one very specific thing, and then they just choose the best from you know, whoever participates. In this case, these are voting platforms. So you click on a story, the vote thing goes up, and they tally your vote. Combining these uh, in, in certain ways, you can start to do more advanced Things. So in the case of Neighborland, uh, it's, it operates on the same philosophy of Ushi, as Ushahidi. So it takes your citizen voice and it captures it and it does something with it. In this case, they're not putting it on a map. What they're doing is they essentially give you uh, this open platform that says, I want blank in my neighborhood. And the, you could fill in that blank with anything. You could say pools, you could say uh, trees, you could say girls, boys, whatever you're into. Um, this, uh, but what this is for is for um, aggregating citizen voice to uh, attract the attention of decision makers who can actually affect these changes. So this is actually being used in uh, New Orleans right now. It was started by uh, a woman named Candy Chang who wanted to improve New Orleans after the, the um, uh, flooding there. Uh, the previous flooding there, uh, to just enrich the neighborhoods uh, and make everything a better place to live. Um, so this is neighborland.com, one way of applying these sort of citizen monitoring technologies. And just to go back there for a second, um, this is a technology that's interesting because this is the type of technology that those seismologists that I was just talking about at the beginning of the story uh, would use in their day-to-day -day activity. It's predictive technology. Just imagine you're a scientist, you're looking at this, and you, you see all these indicators that tell you uh, there may be a quake, but again, there may not be. It could be a statistical anomaly, uh, and you have to act upon uh, this limited information. Um, I personally think it's um, uh, incredible that someone could be charged for making a statistical mistake, but economists might agree with that. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's a nerd joke. Um, <laughs> Uh, other types of monitoring technologies, uh, this is um, taken at the Red Cross Digital um, Operations Center. Um, this is a series of dashboard technologies that they use to monitor the world's activity um, at, at all times, essentially. They, they look for keywords, they look for trends, they look for uh, patterns in, in text and social media. So everything you do online, someone is using in some way. In this case, this is uh, the Red Cross making use of it uh, for, their, for their work. What's uh, interesting here is just all these are uh, tools that are available to all of us right now. I mean, so up in the top, you see, uh, I think that's Hootsuite, and then they've got TweetDeck open. This isn't stuff that they built. This is stuff that's available to us all, and you could essentially create the same dashboard uh, Maybe to monitor your ex, like the last guy I was talking about. Uh, don't do that, but you could do that. Um, <laughs> uh, what, uh, what I do, I, I work with uh, data in uh, very visual ways. So I, I take these big abstract problems and try to simplify them, simplify them for people who are non-technical and who need to make use of it for other means. So. I'll just give you an example of that. This was a project I did with uh, someone uh, during Hurricane Irene, uh, which looked at the social media activity of people using Twitter and used what's called sentiment analysis to sort of 
uh, grade the, the citizen response to the storm as it was coming in. And the reason why they wanted to do this is because they wanted to see if there was a correlation between service delivery, so you know, the FEMA, the organizations that go out and help people during uh, hurricanes and storms, and citizen response. They wanted to see if people were actually positively uh, reacting or if maybe they could find out pockets that were being underserved using these social media trends. And so here the colors um, represent degrees of positive or negativity. So blue uh, represents uh, positive, red represents negative, and the more yellowish colors represent um, uh, the sort of neutral area. Um, and then these are types of technologies that are used in all of these, these, um, these platforms, but our goal is to make it simple to you or to the average person who wants to work with them. Uh, other technologies uh, being used uh, in this space, uh, complexity sciences, uh, essentially taking really big problems and just looking for, if you could imagine just drawing a circle somewhere on that graph, how could you uh, get the most number of circles with a limited size circle. Uh, the num those little tiny, those smaller circles represent problems. And so what they're essentially looking for is the uh, fastest, most efficient way to solve the most amount of problems in the least amount of time. Um, <clears throat> so when you combine all these things together, you in my opinion, you get a different form of democracy. You get tools that allow people to capture this data and use it in ways that benefit them or benefit society. And I like to wonder what these types of technologies could have been used to accomplish in social movements of the past and social movements of the future for people who don't have access to them, um, which is why I feel it's important to simplify them and bring them sort of down to earth. This is an example of some of the things that people have done with these types of technologies. This is a profile from the New York Times that sort of looked at the, it, it used census data in this case, not social media, but it used it to sort of map the distribution of ethnic groups and religious groups and racial groups in New York City uh, to see what type of uh, self-selection was going on or, or other things. Um, but it's, it was very cool graphic because if you, it, they gave you the data in a way that you could play with it and find what you were looking for. They don't, they're not making a case here. They're not saying that this is good or this is bad. They just take the data and they put it on this interactive chart that any one of us can go play with um, should we want to. This one is really important. I do a lot of work in East Africa, um, and in East Africa, uh, in all the whole of the African continent and most, of, most developing countries have the issue of land rights and ownership that are just very hazy and not quite as well defined as they are here. Um, this platform t makes use of crowdsourcing, it makes use of some of these other statistical technologies, and it essentially just allows you to sort of see where the trouble areas are with land rights, where there's conflict, where there's, uh, when I say conflict, I mean uh, where there's a dispute over land rights. And uh, it's a platform, again, that's open, it's available, it's making data uh, accessible to all. Um, and then finally, there's other platforms that might be a little bit, uh, you might be able to resonate with more. I mean, this is uh, uh, essentially applying those sort of predictive technologies to crime in Oakland, uh, California. Uh, and then another project following this slide, uh, taking the same technologies and applying them to uh, the UK. Um, and here, they're, they're, they rely upon historic data but they also rely upon, uh, again, contributions from the public uh, and uh, actual police data to sort of spot where patterns um, are in the city and where uh, police forces can be deployed. And these are technologies that, the, that law enforcement are, are really investing in these days. Um, but what's cool about crime spotting and this one, uh, police.uk, is that they, again, are open to the public, so you can interact. You're not just being fed data. You can draw your own conclusion. Um, so uh, I just uh, want to thank you all for allowing me to come here and talk about uh, very geeky stuff. Uh, I hope that you guys uh, explore data more, and uh, there's a number of tools that are out there available to do it, but I would just encourage you to be more aware of what people are using to monitor you. Thank you.